Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I am now in the middle of my second week of teaching verse by verse through the book of Philippians, and I tell you, this is powerful. What a blessing to have these writings of Paul and to see what's inside of a person that allowed him to stay faithful to God and go through the terrible things that he suffered. And he's just giving us an insight into his heart, what made him tick. And I tell you, this is powerful. So I'm using my computer. Most of the time you don't see me using a computer because I just share the Word, but I've got so many references in this living commentary that I've written. This is a commentary that I've written over the last 45 to 50 years on 27,000 verses in the Bible. And I tell you, this is powerful. And I've got it so that I can just go and put my cursor over a scripture and it'll automatically bring that verse up and it just is so much more convenient. So that's the reason I'm using that. We've also got this little book that we're giving out, Philippians, Paul's letter to the, his partners. This is my gift to you. And then we have DVDs and CDs that were taken from a Gospel Truth Conference that I held in Atlanta where I taught verse by verse through the book of Philippians. And then we've also got the exact teaching that you're watching here on television, either in audio, video, or USB, where it has the audio and video on it taken from our television program. So we've got a lot of ways for you to study through this. But I encourage you to please go to the effort of letting these scriptures deal with you. We've just barely gotten started in this. There's a total of four chapters, and we're only in the middle of the second chapter. But some of the most important things that the Apostle Paul ever said were in this book of Philippians. So we just went through in the second chapter, he's uh, admonishing the believers to stand in unity. The way they do that is in lowliness of mind. They esteem others better than they esteem themselves. They quit looking at things only from their own perspective. They look at things from the perspective of the other person. And then he starts using Jesus as the supreme example of a person who laid down his life and put other people ahead of himself. And I've spent a lot of time talking about this. I'm just overwhelmed thinking about how much God loved us, that He would leave eternity and come and dwell in a physical body and not only suffer the death on the cross, but just for 33 years live as a human. Man, it's hard to believe that God would become a man. Now, He was a God-man. He was God in His spirit, but He had a physical body and the love of God to for 33 years to live on this earth and limit, it, limit himself to being a human being is just incredible. And then because of that, it says that God is exalted in and given him a name. This is in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So this is talking about angelic beings and then on the earth, all people, and then under the earth, that's talking about all the demonic realm. Every created being on this planet is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Verse 11 says, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so as I was sharing on our program yesterday, it only does you any good if you confess it in this life. If you wait until you stand before God and you see His glory and then you realize how wrong you've been and then you repent and then you bow the knee and then you confess Jesus is Lord, it's not going to do you any good in eternity. You have to make that decision now. Once you see Him in His glory, there's not going to be any faith involved. And it's by faith, that's that's what pleases God. It's only by faith that you access what God does. Once you are forced into acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus, that's not going to do you any good. You're going to spend an eternity separated from God. So you need to make Jesus your Lord now. And we've got a number that we'll put on the screen. We've got people standing by that could pray with you. If you've never done that, you need to make Jesus your Lord today. And people can pray with you and help you. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So Paul is saying that he doesn't want people to just respond while he's there and basically forcing them, coercing them, encouraging them. He, what he's really praying for is that people would just grab this heart and do it of their own free will. 
You know, it's like when you raise your children, when they're young, you tell them, you say thank you, you say I love you, and you tell them to do this, and they do it just out of obedience. And then ultimately, they get to where they're kind of modeling you and following your leadership. But what every parent is really looking for is when the child will just do it out of their own heart, not because somebody's going to be telling them to do it, not because they are always watching somebody who's modeling it, but it just becomes their heart. That's what Paul is praying. And he prayed right here, he says, that you would work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this isn't talking about that you save yourself, but when you get born again, God gives you everything. When you get born again, the spirit that you receive at salvation is the same spirit that you'll have throughout all eternity. And according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it's the same spirit that is in Christ Jesus right now. As He is, so are you in this earth. So in your spirit, you've already got salvation, but it doesn't do any good if you keep it in your spirit. You've got to work it out. That's what the next verse says in verse 13. It says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His own good pleasure. And then that 12th verse says, Now you work it out. God puts it in you, but you've got to draw it out. And how do you do that? Romans chapter 12 Verse 2 says, and don't be conformed to this world. Don't be poured into the mold. Don't be like everybody else, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed there is the Greek word metamorpho. It's the word we get metamorphosis from. It's describing the process of a caterpillar spinning a cocoon, and then it comes out this beautiful butterfly. If you want to change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, if you want transformation, you do that by the renewing of your mind. So God puts everything that you will ever need on the inside of you. There isn't any lack in your born-again spirit. If you need to be healed, you've already got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you, but you have to draw it out. If you need prosperity, you've got the blessing of God already given unto you. Ephesians 1, 3, you're already blessed, but you've got to draw it out. If you want joy and peace, you've already got that according to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc. You've already got it, but you've got to draw it out. You know, I've often thought of it's like a person that's leaning against a well and you're dying of thirst and you're just praying and asking God, oh, for a drop of water. And yet there's this well, but it doesn't do you any good unless you can draw that water out. You could die of thirst leaning against a well that has all of the life-giving water that you need, but if you can't draw it out, it does you no good. Likewise, Christians have everything on the inside of them that they will ever need. Healing, prosperity, joy, peace, anointing, wisdom, everything that you will ever need is already in your born-again spirit. So God works it in, but now you have to work out your own salvation. Boy, that is a great word picture right there. God has given you everything, but it doesn't automatically work. You got to draw it out. And how do you do that? By the renewing of your mind. That's how you get transformed. That's how you change from a person who is an old sinner saved by grace. And now you become the righteousness of God and you are manifesting His power and His victory and joy and peace in your life. It's through the renewing of your mind. Man, that is powerful. In verse 14, he says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. You know, most people just pass over this verse and don't give it the importance that it needs. But if you were to go back and study the children of Israel, they just murmured, murmured, murmured constantly. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 11, and it says that all of the things that happened in the Old Testament happened for our learning, that we through them might learn not to murmur, not to complain. And yet many Christians just love to complain. They complain about politics. They complain about the weather. They complain about everything. I, there's some people around me that honestly, every time you get around them, they are going to find something to complain about, about the speed limit, about the way that it's enforced or not enforced. About They just are constantly murmuring and complaining. That is an ungodly attitude. Now, I am not talking about sticking your head in the sand and somehow or another just thinking, well, there are no problems. There's plenty of problems. But are you going to focus on them or are you going to focus on the antidote for all of these problems, which is Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Holy Spirit and things like this? 
YOU CAN FOCUS ON THE PROBLEMS OR YOU CAN FOCUS ON THE ANSWER. AND I TELL YOU, OUR WORLD IS JUST GEARED TOWARDS ALL THE NEGATIVE. THE NEWS MEDIA DOESN'T REPORT ALL OF THE PLANS THAT LAND SAFELY. THEY DON'T REPORT ALL OF THE PEOPLE THAT GET TO THEIR DESTINATION IN THEIR CAR. THEY REPORT ON THE WRECKS. THEY REPORT ON THE CRASHES. THEY REPORT ON THE NEGATIVE THINGS. BAD NEWS SELLS. AND I TELL YOU, IF YOU AREN'T CAREFUL, YOU'LL GET TO WHERE YOU JUST GRAVITATE TOWARDS THIS AND YOU'RE ALWAYS GRIPING AND COMPLAINING. YOU KNOW, WHEN IT COMES TO POLITICS, ONE OF THE THINGS THAT I'VE DONE IS WHEN PEOPLE GO TO TALKING ABOUT HOW BAD EVERYTHING IS, AND AGAIN, I'M NOT DENYING THAT THERE'S PLENTY OF BAD AND THERE'S LOTS OF JUNK GOING ON AND SOMETIMES YOU NEED TO CONFRONT IT AND DEAL WITH IT. BUT ONE OF THE WAYS THAT I'VE DEALT WITH THIS IS WHEN PEOPLE GO TO GRIPING ABOUT THE PRESIDENT OR ABOUT WHATEVER, YOU KNOW, and, AND IT JUST GETS TO WHERE IT'S NOT JUST ACKNOWLEDGING THAT WE'VE GOT A PROBLEM, BUT IT'S JUST MURMURING AND DISPUTINGS AND COMPLAININGS, CONTRARY TO WHAT THIS VERSE SAYS. WHAT I'LL DO IS JUST SAY, WELL, THE BIBLE SAYS IN First TIMOTHY CHAPTER 2 THAT WE'RE SUPPOSED TO PRAY FOR ALL OF THOSE THAT ARE IN AUTHORITY. SO LET'S PRAY FOR THEM RIGHT NOW. INSTEAD OF CRITICIZING, LET'S JUST PRAY. AND YOU START PRAYING. YOU'LL EITHER CHANGE THAT PERSON TO WHERE THEY WILL START FOCUSING ON THE POSITIVE OR IF THEY JUST WANT TO KEEP GRIPING AND COMPLAINING, THEY'LL QUIT DUMPING ALL OF THEIR GRIPES AND COMPLAINTS IN YOUR TRASH CAN. THEY'LL QUIT TALKING TO YOU ABOUT IT. EITHER WAY, YOU SOLVE THE PROBLEM. SO THIS IS REALLY IMPORTANT. WE'RE SUPPOSED TO DO ALL THINGS. AND IF YOU LOOK THIS UP IN THE GREEK, THAT WORD ALL MEANS ALL THINGS. <laughs> AMEN. ALL THINGS WITHOUT MURMURINGS AND DISPUTINGS. IN VERSE 15, IT SAYS THAT YOU MAY BE BLAMELESS AND HARMLESS. YOU KNOW, THERE'S A DIFFERENCE BETWEEN BEING BLAMELESS AND SINLESS. NONE OF US DO EVERYTHING PERFECTLY. BUT IF YOUR HEART IS RIGHT, EVEN WHEN YOU MAKE A MISTAKE, YOU'RE BLAMELESS. IT'S NOT MALICIOUS ON YOUR PART. AND ESPECIALLY WHEN YOU TRUST THE LORD, HE JUST TAKES AWAY ALL OF THE GUILT OF IT, AND YOU ARE BLAMELESS AND HARMLESS, THE SONS OF GOD, WITHOUT REBUKE, IN THE MIDST OF A CROOKED AND PERVERSE NATION. YOU KNOW, THIS WORD CROOKED RIGHT HERE WAS TRANSLATED FROM A uh, GREEK WORD. LET ME SEE HERE. IT'S SCOLIOS IS THE GREEK WORD, AND IT'S THE WORD THAT WE GET SCOLIOSIS FROM, DESCRIBING CURVATURE OF THE SPINE. SO THIS SAYS THAT WE ARE SUPPOSED TO LIVE BLAMELESS AND HARMLESS AS THE SONS OF GOD WITHOUT REBUKE IN THE MIDST OF A CROOKED AND PERVERSE NATION, A NATION THAT'S CROOKED LIKE THE CURVATURE OF THE SPINE. I THINK THAT WORD PICTURE IS REALLY GOOD. AND THE WORD PERVERSE HERE MEANS TO DISTORT, TO MISINTERPRET OR MORALLY CORRUPT. AND I GUARANTEE YOU, WE ARE IN A GENERATION NOW THAT IS JUSTIFYING PEDOPHILIA, THAT'S JUSTIFYING ADULTERY, THAT'S JUSTIFYING PROFANITY. YOU KNOW, I CAN'T HARDLY READ A NEWS uh, uh, REPORT OF ANYTHING WITHOUT THEY'RE BEING LACED WITH PROFANITY AND THESE PEOPLE JUST USING PROFANE LANGUAGE AND HOMOSEXUALITY, TRANSGENDERISM, AND ON AND ON AND ON IT GOES. THIS IS PERVERSE. IF YOU DON'T RECOGNIZE THAT WE ARE LIVING IN THE MIDST OF A CROOKED AND PERVERSE NATION, YOU AREN'T PAYING ATTENTION. YOU AREN'T JUDGING THINGS ACCORDING TO THE WORD OF GOD. YOU KNOW, OVER IN SECOND PETER CHAPTER 2, IT TALKS ABOUT LOT, AND HE WAS A RIGHTEOUS MAN, BUT IN DWELLING AMONG THE UNGODLY, HE SEEING AND HEARING THEIR UNGODLY DEEDS, HE VEXED HIS RIGHTEOUS SOUL FROM DAY TO DAY. AND THAT WORD VEX IS TALKING ABOUT THAT HE TORMENTED HIMSELF. AND I GUARANTEE YOU, IF YOU AREN'T CAREFUL, IF YOU ARE JUST PLUGGED INTO THIS WORLD AND LISTENING TO ALL OF THE UNGODLINESS, THE NEWS OF THE TEN SPIES NETWORK TODAY, I GUARANTEE YOU, IT'S GOING TO VEX YOUR RIGHTEOUS SOUL. IT'S GOING TO har HARM YOU. BUT THIS SAYS THAT YOU CAN BE BLAMELESS AND HARMLESS WITHOUT REBUKE IN THE MIDST OF A CROOKED AND PERVERSE NATION AMONG WHOM YE SHINE AS LIGHTS IN THE WORLD. WE ARE THE LIGHT OF THE WORLD IS WHAT JESUS SAID IN THE SERMON ON THE MOUNTAIN, MATTHEW CHAPTER 5. WE ARE THE SALT OF THE EARTH. WE ARE THE LIGHT OF THE WORLD. AND WE'VE GOT TO LET THIS LIGHT SHINE. AND THERE'S SO MANY CHRISTIANS TODAY THAT ARE PUTTING THEIR LIGHT UNDER A BUSHEL. THEY'RE HIDING IT. THEY AREN'T LETTING IT SHINE. AND BECAUSE OF IT, PEOPLE ALL AROUND US ARE FALLING AND HURTING THEMSELVES. AND GOING OFF THE DEEP END BECAUSE THEY DON'T HAVE ANY LIGHT. WE NEED TO START SHINING OUR LIGHT. AND THIS IS WHAT THESE SCRIPTURES ARE TALKING ABOUT. HOW DO WE DO THAT? HOW DO WE LET OUR LIGHT SHINE IN THIS WORLD? IN VERSE 16, IT SAYS, HOLDING FORTH THE WORD OF LIFE, 
THAT I MAY REJOICE IN THE DAY OF CHRIST THAT I HAVE NOT RUN IN VAIN, NEITHER LABORED IN VAIN. SO HOW IS IT THAT YOU ARE THE LIGHT OF THE WORLD? YOU GOT TO SPEAK FORTH THE WORD OF LIFE. AND THERE ARE SO MANY CHRISTIANS TODAY THAT HAVE JUST BEEN COWED INTO SUBMISSION. THERE ARE MANY CHRISTIANS THAT ARE TRYING TO HIDE THEIR CHRISTIANITY AND MAKE IT SOMETHING THAT'S JUST PERSONAL BETWEEN THEM AND GOD. DID YOU KNOW IF YOUR RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD DOESN'T TRANSLATE INTO YOU REFLECTING IT IN YOUR DEALINGS WITH OTHER PEOPLE, THEN YOU DON'T HAVE A GOOD RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD. I GUARANTEE YOU, GOD DOES NOT WANT YOU TO BE A SPY, A SECRET AGENT. HE WANTS YOU TO BE BOLD AND JUST LIKE THIS SAYS, HOLDING FORTH THE WORD OF LIFE. YOU NEED TO SPEAK THE TRUTH. THERE ARE MANY OF YOU THAT WORK IN ENVIRONMENTS WHERE IT IS PROMOTING ALL OF THIS UNGODLINESS, ALL OF THIS DEI AND CRITICAL RACE THEORY AND ON AND ON, AND THERE ARE CHRISTIANS THAT ARE JUST GOING ALONG TO GET ALONG. THAT'S NOT A GODLY ATTITUDE. YOU NEED TO STAND UP AND SPEAK THE TRUTH. NOW, THERE'S A RIGHT AND A WRONG WAY TO DO IT. YOU DON'T HAVE TO BE MEAN ABOUT IT. YOU KNOW, I REMEMBER A TIME THAT I WAS PLAYING BASKETBALL WITH A GROUP OF GUYS, AND, and THEY WERE PEOPLE I'D NEVER SEEN BEFORE. THEY WEREN'T FRIENDS OF MINE, AND, and we, WE JUST MEANT THEM, AND WE STARTED PLAYING BASKETBALL, AND EVERY TIME THEY MISSED A SHOT, THEY WOULD JUST BLASPHEME GOD. THEY WOULD CURSE. THEY WOULD SAY ALL THIS JUNK, AND MAN, IT WAS GRATING ON ME. I HATE THAT KIND OF STUFF. I HATE PROFANITY. PROFANITY IS AN in INDICATION THAT YOU AREN'T VERY SMART IN MY ESTIMATION. AND I KNOW THAT THERE'S PEOPLE THAT WILL TAKE OFFENSE AT THAT, BUT MAN, IF YOU CAN'T EXPRESS YOURSELF WITHOUT BLASPHEMING GOD AND DOING IT, SOMETHING'S WRONG WITH YOU. AND IT JUST GRATED ON ME THE WAY THAT THEY WERE DOING THINGS. BUT RATHER THAN COME OUT AND REBUKE THEM OR SAY SOMETHING BAD, YOU KNOW, WHEN I MISSED A SHOT, I JUST STARTED GOING, HALLELUJAH, PRAISE GOD, THANK YOU, JESUS. <laughs> AND THESE GUYS, THEY LET IT GO A COUPLE OF TIMES AND LOOKED AT ME, BUT THEN FINALLY THEY SAID, WHAT ARE YOU DOING? AND I SAID, YOU PRAISE YOUR GOD, I PRAISE MY GOD. AND I DIDN'T DO IT IN A CONDEMNING WAY. I DID IT JUST POINTING OUT THAT, YOU KNOW, THAT THAT'S NOT THE RIGHT WAY TO TALK. AND ANYWAY, THEY GOT THE MESSAGE AND THEY DIDN'T TAKE OFFENSE. AND THEN WHEN THEY MISSED A SHOT, THEY'D LOOK AT ME AND THEY'D GO, HALLELUJAH, AND I'D GO, HALLELUJAH. <laughs> AND THEY WEREN'T REALLY SINCERE, BUT YOU KNOW WHAT? IT DEALT WITH THE PROBLEM. AND I MADE A STATEMENT, AND I GUARANTEE YOU, they, THE LORD COULD HAVE USED THAT. SO YOU DON'T HAVE TO BE MEAN WITH IT, BUT WE'VE GOT TO HOLD FORTH THE WORD OF LIFE. WE'VE GOT TO SPEAK THE TRUTH. WE CAN'T COUNT ON THE UNGODLY TO SPEAK THE TRUTH. WE CAN'T COUNT ON UNBELIEVERS TO COUNTER ALL OF THIS WOKEISM AND MEN AND WOMEN'S SPORTS AND AND MEN BEING IN SHOWERS WITH WOMEN BECAUSE THEY CLAIM TO BE A WOMAN THAT DAY, THAT STUFF IS DEMONIC. THAT IS DEMONIC. IT'S PERVERSE. AND WE NEED TO STAND UP AND SPEAK THE TRUTH. THAT'S WHAT IT SAYS. YOU HAVE TO HOLD FORTH THIS WORD OF LIFE. THIS IS THE WORD OF LIFE. THIS IS THE WORD OF GOD. AND WE'RE THE ONES WHO HAVE THIS WORD COMMITTED UNTO US, AND IT'S UP TO US TO LET THIS uh, GO FORTH INTO THIS WORLD. YOU KNOW, THERE'S A STATEMENT THAT I'M SURE MANY OF YOU HAVE HEARD, BUT IT SAYS, YOU ARE THE ONLY BIBLE THAT SOME PEOPLE ARE EVER GOING TO READ. MOST PEOPLE AREN'T READING THE BIBLE. YOU HAVE TO LIVE THE WORD OF GOD. YOU HAVE TO SPEAK THE WORD OF GOD. AND YOU CAN'T JUST SAY, WELL, I'M LETTING MY ACTIONS TESTIFY. DID YOU KNOW THAT THERE'S SOME GOOD PEOPLE WHO DON'T GIVE IN TO OUR WOKE AGENDA AND TO ALL THE IMMORALITY TODAY, BUT THEY AREN'T DOING IT IN THE NAME OF THE LORD. THEY'RE DOING IT IN THEIR OWN POWER. AND THEY'RE TAKING THE GLORY FOR THEIR OWN GOODNESS. NO, YOU NEED TO GO BEYOND JUST ACTING RIGHT. YOU NEED TO TELL PEOPLE WHY YOU'RE ACTING RIGHT AND GIVE THE GLORY AND THE CREDIT TO GOD. THAT'S WHAT THIS IS TALKING ABOUT. AND IF YOU'LL DO THAT, PAUL SAID THAT HE, he WILL NOT HAVE RUN IN VAIN, NEITHER LABORED IN VAIN. IN OTHER WORDS, IT'S NOT UP TO US JUST TO MINISTER, BUT IT'S UP TO THE PERSON THAT WE'RE MINISTERING TO. THEY HAVE A RESPONSIBILITY ALSO TO RECEIVE. AND PAUL WAS TELLING THESE PEOPLE THAT HE HOPED THAT THEY RESPONDED PROPERLY SO THAT HIS LABOR ON THEM WOULDN'T BE IN VAIN. AND THEN IN VERSE 17, HE SAYS, YEA, AND IF I BE OFFERED UPON THE SACRIFICE AND SERVICE OF YOUR FAITH, I JOY AND REJOICE WITH YOU ALL. AGAIN, THIS GOES BACK TO WHAT PAUL SAID IN PHILIPPIANS CHAPTER 1 ABOUT THAT HE WAS, FOR HIM TO LIVE AS CHRIST AND TO DIE AS GAIN, AND HE WAS READY TO STAND AND GIVE TESTIMONY IN FRONT OF CAESAR WHETHER HE LIVED OR DIED. HE WAS WILLING TO SACRIFICE HIS LIFE SO THAT OTHER PEOPLE COULD HEAR THE TRUTH. AND COULD BE SET FREE. AND NOW HE'S SAYING THAT HE WANTS HIS LABOR THAT HE BESTOWED UPON THESE PEOPLE, THE PRAYERS FOR THEM, THE WAY THAT HE SPOKE THE WORD, THE WAY THAT HE HAD ENDURED PERSECUTION, 
and had been beaten and put in jail. He wanted all of these things to work together uh, so that they would be transformed by the Word of God. And if that happened, he said that he would be glad to be offered on the sacrifice of ministering to them. That's the way that we need to get. Not everybody's going to receive what we've got to say. You know, I said these things earlier uh, in the previous week, but Paul was writing to his partners here and these Philippians, according to Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, they were the only people that Paul ever ministered to that supported him after he left the local area. That's a shame. But because of that, they were special to him. And there were things said to the Philippians that don't just apply to everybody. You go to a different level when you start not only thinking about yourself, but you start giving to other people. And Paul here was saying that, man, he's willing to be offered upon the sacrifice of their service if it means that they're going to prosper. What a godly attitude. That's the attitude that Paul had. That's the attitude that uh, Jesus had. And that's the attitude that he's wanting us to have. And so in verse 18, he says, For this same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Not only is Paul rejoicing, if he wound up being killed in front of Nero because of his stance for the Word of God and speaking the truth, he would rejoice, and he also said that you need to rejoice with me. Did you know if you truly love people and you see them suffering things, sometimes it's harder on the person who is watching a believer suffer than it is on the believer themselves because that believer knows that God is going to compensate them and they'll have a recompense for whatever they've suffered. But the people who love them, they suffer sometimes more than the person going through the hardship. Well, you need to have this same attitude that Paul is talking about here. And he says, not only am I going to rejoice if I'm sacrificed for your sake, but you need to rejoice at that because he's going to be compensated. And you look at these people like Tyndale. You look at people that were burned at the stake. You look at the Fox's Book of Martyrs and all of the people who died to, because they refused to renounce their faith. They were going to continue to speak the Word of God. And I guarantee you, we can rejoice with them because now they are in eternity and God is going to so overwhelm them with His acceptance that it'll just, it'll totally diminish all of the rejection they ever had to deal with. We can rejoice over those kind of things. And then in verse 19, he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So the Philippians had wanted to know how Paul was doing. He had spent these two chapters telling them how he's doing. Now he says, I'm sending Timothy because I want to know how you're doing. Paul loved these people, and we ought to have this kind of love for people that we pray for other people, not just about ourselves, but we pray with and for other people. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material, and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.